Hey friends, welcome back to the Journal Feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and I am here to spoon feed you the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. Okay, let's take a quick look ahead at everything that we'll be covering from this year. First off, Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, happy New Year. The first article from this week from Monday was actually a big list of the best articles of the year. Second, what is the ideal oxygen target for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? Oka. Third, how about oxygen targets but now in the ICU? After that, 2022 in review as it relates to resuscitation. And then from the last article, let's uh, show lidocaine a little bit of love. If you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber and so will not be receiving the full Journal Feed podcast, only receiving a portion of the past week summaries, and really just not starting off the new year right. Don't worry though, all the articles are good articles, but if you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you will have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And we don't ever want money to be a barrier to patient care, so if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, just reach out and we will help out. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by Laura Murphy, Jason Lesnick, Megan Hilbert, and Clay Smith. Now, from the first article, like I said, it was actually just a list of ours that we do every new year, which are the list of the best articles or the greatest articles from 2022. Now, sadly, I don't keep my own list of my own favorite articles. Maybe I'll try to do that this year. Off the top of my head, I'd really like to maybe call attention to all the stuff that we've been seeing from this past year about paralysis awareness in the emergency department. I think that's a big failing of ours and one that could be fairly easily corrected. After that, then, of course, I think I would have to go with esophageal bougenage, just because I get to say that word. That takes the cake. And then we're going to skip right over to the fourth article. Titled 2022 International Consensus on Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation and Emergency Cardiovascular Care Science with Treatment Recommendations. Summary for basic life support, advanced life support, pediatric life support, neonatal life support, education, implementation, and teams, and first aid task forces out of the Journal of Circulation. Now, year after year is the slow battle against cardiac arrest, and every improvement that we make at this point is really quite incremental, but each one counts. Here are the treatment recommendations based on the recent literature from 2022 as reviewed by the experts at ILCOR. Of course, we'll only be delivering a spoonful, but this annual publication reviewed 400 publications and addressed 60 topics, from first aid all the way to all the different kinds of life support. Most recommendations were weak or very weak, and made with low or very low certainty, but that is the price of trying to be at the cutting edge. So let's dive in. An interesting recommendation they made was that CPR be done on scene rather than using ambulance transport unless you're going to be transporting the patient for ECMO or some other critical intervention that they could receive. At first, this seemed a little bit radical to me, but the authors do cite associations with a decreased CPR quality as well as an increased risk to the CPR providers when they're transporting the patient. A single study even found lower survival rates among transported patients. All this was a weak recommendation. The authors made a strong recommendation against the use of a precordial thump in cardiac arrest, which was very low certainty evidence. That's not much fun, but honestly, unless you watch the patient arrest directly in front of you, I really don't imagine this is going to be very useful. Then next, we have a weak recommendation for actively preventing fever by targeting a temperature of 37.5 for all patients who are comatose post rosc Don't worry, though, TTM3 is in the works and should clear up what we should be doing in terms of temperature for these comatose patients. Then, something that won't be very popular to the emergency medicine community is the weak recommendation against the routine use of POCUS during CPR based on low certainty evidence. They do concede that it may be considered and it may be useful as a diagnostic tool to, you know, look at some reversible causes of arrest. Think things like tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade. Honestly, though, I think a lot of people are more using it uh, prognostically. Then there were weak recommendations against the use of vasopressin and steroids in addition to usual care for adult in-hospital cardiac arrest, low to moderate certainty evidence, and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, very low and low certainty evidence. I'll call this one as fair, though. The evidence really isn't that compelling for it. 
I'd also like to point out that vitamin C was not mentioned anywhere. Stop doing trials on it, please. Now, this was a massive effort and a huge paper. It's worth a flip through. In a spoonful, all the latest and greatest of resuscitation from 2022, all in one paper. And then we have the last article titled Comparative Effectiveness of Amiodarone and Lidocaine for Treatment of In-Hospital Cardiac Arrest out of the journal Chest. This often isn't appreciated, but the American Heart Association ACLS guidelines are made for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. But there are plenty of in-hospital cardiac arrests happening every day. I mean, we keep all the sick people in one place. Yeah, some hearts are going to stop. Are the ACLS recommendations optimized for in-hospital cardiac arrest as well? This was a retrospective cohort study completed using the AHA's Get With the Guideline Resuscitation Inpatient Registry. They looked at 15,000 adult patients with in-hospital cardiac arrest who had either VTAC or VFib and received defibrillation as well as one of either lidocaine or amiodarone. The primary outcome was ROSC. Not very patient-centered, but, you know, what are you going to do? The data was analyzed using propensity score matching and reported in average marginal effects, which represents the risk difference between the two groups, amiodarone and lidocaine. What they found was that lidocaine actually had a significantly higher rate of ROSC, an average marginal effect of 2-3%. to 3%. 24-hour survival, survival to discharge, and survival with favorable neurological outcomes also favored lidocaine by about 3%. This study was limited by being retrospective, and so we'll never know the whole story, but you know there was a signal, and honestly most of the time I don't really have a good reason for picking one over the other, so maybe I'll start trying to favor lidocaine in my in-hospital cardiac arrests. In a spoonful, this large retrospective study showed a benefit to the use of lidocaine over amiodarone for in-hospital cardiac arrest with VFib or VTAC. Okay, let's do our wrap-up. What did we learn today? Then from the fourth article, we did a quick review of what's new to recess from 2022. And then from the last article, for your next in-hospital cardiac arrest, take a moment to consider between lidocaine and amiodarone. Both are recommended, and from this trial, lidocaine is perhaps a little bit better. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where the newsletter is the best way to make the podcast into a bite-sized nugget of space repetition. If you're feeling like you're missing out, you're feeling like you could have heard more journal feed, why don't you start off the new year right and come over and join us in the members feed. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and then use that information to save lives, one spoonful at a time. Happy New Year.